I remember the first time I saw two pressure switches on a service call, I was at a complete loss. But once I knew what the control board was actually checking with that second switch, I started catching clues I didn't even know I was being given, even heat exchanger problems. But here's a foundation principle that we're going to start with that will upset some people. Pressure switches don't monitor specific problems or parts. They're not there to watch condensate drainage. They're not there to detect a flow restriction. They'll never know the difference between a plugged fresh air intake, a plugged secondary heat exchanger, or a failed inducer motor. Pressure switches aren't assigned to parts. They're there to monitor status, which all of these parts play a role in, of course. They're there for one job and one job only, to tell the control board, hey, pressure's not where it's supposed to be, so you can't run. That's it. It's a binary safety permission check. Yes or no, zero or one. By itself, there isn't much diagnostic information to go on. So why do some furnaces only have one switch while others have two? Because pressure doesn't stay the same through the combustion air path while the furnace is running. Conditions change and pressure changes with it. Inducer speeds can change. Firing rates can change. Heat exchangers warm up. Condensate forms, airflow demand changes, and all of that can shift pressures. So pressure isn't uniform from one point in the combustion air path to another because there's resistance everywhere. Every PVC 90, every change of direction in the heat exchangers, every drop of water inside those tubes all change the air pressure along the way. So two switches means the board wants confirmation twice, either at a different time, like a stage change on a two-stage furnace, or from a second reference point. And this is because you can have a situation, for example, where you have a plugged up secondary heat exchanger, but it might not cause enough of a pressure change at the inducer draft motor to trip a switch that's tapped into that location. Now that's all great, but how do we use this to reveal the clues we need when we're investigating the cause of a trip? First thing you wanna do is you wanna know what the control board is actually looking at. And this is easy enough to do by just tracing out the hoses. Dual switches for staging are really easy to identify because they're going to combine together somehow into one hose that just taps into one location on the furnace. So you might see something like you look, see here on the left where both hoses come off the switches to a T-fitting and then one hose goes to the furnace. Or you might see something like on the right here where both of those switches are stuck together back to back with one hose coming off to the furnace, usually the inducer draft motor area. And these are teed off internally. Another thing you just want to keep in mind is that when these switches are set up like this, they are not wired in series. The 24 volts doesn't have to go through one switch and then the other. The control board monitors each one of these switches independently. So you might have a Molex plug with pins labeled P1 and P2, for example. Now that can lead to situations where your first stage might be running just fine, but the switch doesn't close when second stage kicks in. Maybe the gas valve doesn't open on second stage, or maybe the inducer draft motor doesn't kick into second stage if there is one. There could even be a slight restriction in the flue path that's not severe enough to cut out the pressure switch on first stage, but it does on the second. So understanding exactly what the control board is looking at specifically, uh, you could start coming up with the clues you need to start investigating and finding out where the likely problem may be. Now, here's a great example of how following the hoses, knowing what the control board is reading, and understanding how it works can reveal an absolute goldmine of diagnostic clues that you can use. Now, if you look closely here, you see three pressure switches. What? I mean, that can be even more intimidating, but just follow the hoses. So our switch in the upper left here has a hose coming off of it and it goes down to what looks like the secondary heat exchanger area. Now we don't see any other hoses teeing off of that or anything, so this is an actual independent reading for the control board just to measure that pressure down by the secondary heat exchanger, which can be different from other parts of the combustion air path. Now this is where the condensation forms, so if you have a drain line backing up, that is the switch that's most likely going to detect it. Now in the upper right here, we have what looks like the compound switch that we talked about earlier. Two switches kind of connected together with one hose coming off of it to the inducer draft motor. Now this is for two-stage firing. I know the pressure switch with the lower water column rating is going to be for first stage, and the one with the higher water column rating will be for second stage heat. These are also the switches that will most likely be affected if you have obstructions in combustion air intake or exhaust. 
Now, as we discussed earlier, those first and second stage switches are not going to be wired in series. Those are independent inputs to the control board. So now I know the control board is looking at two separate pressures at two different times with the control board receiving each one of those signals as independent inputs. Now, what I also know, general knowledge on furnaces, is that the control board is looking for certain pressure ranges on startup. So that first stage pressure switch is going to be one of those requirements. That pressure switch detecting from the secondary and condensate area, that's probably going to be another one. So if both those conditions have to be proper in order for the furnace to start up. Those may be wired in series, one after the other. But most modern control boards, they'll actually treat that other pressure switch as an independent input in the board. So I could have a P3 as well. One more thing I want to cover here, you might notice there's another hose coming off of this compound switch going to the gas valve. Now that is not measuring gas pressure, so it's not tapped directly into the gas line itself, it's just on the opposite side of a diaphragm. So as you can see, just from a picture, I have over 12 pieces of information and clues to work with, and I haven't even pulled out any tools yet. I also haven't gotten to the best part yet, which tells you even more, timing. In the beginning of the video, I mentioned how sometimes pressure switch problems can give you clues on heat exchanger problems. I was in one situation, for example, where the furnace had a sealed combustion chamber, just like you see here in this picture. And the furnace fired up just fine, but as soon as the blower motor came on, the whole thing shut down. Now with that pressure switch monitoring the pressure in that sealed chamber, you have a negative pressure that's going on inside the heat exchanger tubes themselves. But on the outside of the heat exchanger, the pressure goes very positive when that blower turns on. If you have a cracked heat exchanger, that positive pressure could be making its way into the inside of the heat exchanger tubes, changing the negative pressure there enough to open a switch. Now, this is not how you diagnose cracked heat exchangers, but it's a clue that tells you maybe that's something to start looking at. Timing is that element that allows you to take all the clues you've gathered together and start eliminating some and highlighting others. And everything we covered in this video all happened before we even pulled out a single tool.